Hello, I'm Leticia Latino, CEO of Neptuno USA. Welcome to the Views from the Center Data Panel. This session brings together incredible industry leaders. We're going to discuss how data centers are adapting to the wireless world from edge to enablement and connectivity. We know that real-time communication is changing the way we interact with our world. The technologies of tomorrow will require a massively distributed network of interconnected edge colocation data centers that are at the foundation of 5G. So um, I'm very excited about this. Coming from the wireless world, I have an incredible uh, set of speakers here. And uh, why don't we jump right into it? And uh, I have a first question for uh, Hugh Karpikin, who's co-founder and chief strategy office of Darpoint. Hello, Hugh. Uh, in your opinion, um, the edge has brought a lot of hype to the industry, but nothing really happens without first addressing the business model, which allows the edge ecosystem to profitably deploy and operate. As a company that also has a focus on underserved markets, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Absolutely. Thank you, Leticia. There's been many folks that have, uh, have been transplanting business models uh, that are existing in the data center telecommunications into the edge. But the edge actually is its own business model where you have got traditionally a few industries uh, in telecommunications uh, working together. My last count is we have upwards to 40 separate industries operating at the edge. Um, that's very important to know. For example, why does Porsche not have an ASN? Okay, um, so those are things that should should understand where some of these macro companies, how they're trying to move their data, how they're trying to engage their end users. And each one of these industries, each one of these companies within these industries consume the edge very, very, very differently. They consume it from uh, what actually they're purchasing. They're consuming it from where they actually need to be. And edge to one company might be the core for someone else. Um, and so those are things that need to be understood. And within each one of those, there's a requirement, different levels of redundancy. It is not a one size fits all. There is, uh, so these are things, there, there's also a timing aspect that there are first movers historically. We've been doing this since 2012. Our first data center came up in 2013, very small, what we call kind of a micro data center, where we were able to begin building these ecosystems where you've got first movers, and then you've got kind of middle adopters, and then you have late adopters. And bringing those all together in the right sequence will prevent your data center from sitting empty and idle for a lot longer than your CFO would like. And those are, that's extremely important. There's a lot of also people that when you look at, hey, we just got to build these things, I have built a lot of spec, okay? And I am proud to say that not a single one of those worked. Okay, because you can literally be a thousand feet off and be completely out of the money. Okay, and understanding these things and understanding, um, I used to build uh, uh, my earlier company in the 2000s, we built cellular backhaul. Um, and so I kind of am, am responsible for a lot of the, 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 the rat's nest that is out there in the world. Um, if, you're, if you're relying on some of the power and you're relying on some of the fiber and you don't truly understand what it is and where it's coming from, you might be physically closer to the customer, but you are logically thousands of miles away. And these are things that will affect the performance. And also there's pricing. Pricing is very different at the edge. There's a lot of people that said, hey, we're going to price this at this cost per kilowatt or per increment. Um, but what you're selling and how much you're selling it for um, is, is dramatically changing at the edge as well. Thank you so much, Hugh. I think it's very introspective. Uh, I know that business models are top of mind uh, uh, for many people, so I appreciate your, your view on that. So let's move into uh, Martin. Martin Hannigan is founder and CEO of Deep Edge. Um, it's been said that neutral networking capabilities uh, enhance speeds, reduce latency, and offer flexibility and freedom of choice. Do you think this natural networking is, is an optimal model? Well, specifically for the internet it is, and I think that it translates well to specifically for the edge. And the reason neutrality is important on the edge, and in my opinion, it's actually more important is opportunity. And as, as Hugh alluded to, and by the way, I agree with almost everything that he said with respect to the business model, you, you, you're going to need to have interconnection opportunity. And the more opportunity you have, the more 
potential customer base that you have. And, and if you're trying to get into the edge business or you are in the edge business, um, from almost all uh, perspectives, customers have to be there with you, not after you. And neutrality is a big part of that. Hmm. Very, very interesting, and and I think that goes it goes well with a with an, a question um, I had uh, for Tim Parker, senior VP of Network Strategy, Flexential. The concept of uh, hybrid edge networking it's also something that comes up, and I know your company develops strategies and architectures in this context of interconnection technology. As some that comes from the wireless world, I would love to lear, learn more about this, this developing hybrid edge network. Uh, thanks, Leticia. Yeah, so, you know, it's really important in today's industry that we're building these ecosystems. And, and so that's what hybrid edge is all about, is having options and, and different services available to customers. And so when you start thinking about what the wireless out in the tower world is going to be bringing into the networks, that interconnectivity to those larger data centers that are out in proximity brings that ability to distribute your compute closer to the edge. We have a lot of challenges around how we're going to get this ultra low latency for all the AI and the immersive experiences and the content distribution out there. But in the end, all of that is still gonna to need to be interconnected back to your hyperscalers and your clouds and, and all your large compute. Micro data centers that are gonna sit out at the edge are gonna be very small, maybe you know, nine to 12 racks and maybe 200 kilowatts at the most. But the compute that's going to drive those are going to be 25 to 50 racks and they're going to be, you know, the 500 kW type of deployments. And so you've got to start to build this hybrid edge and then they're going to need that interconnectivity. And, you know, Martin kind of alluded to the neutrality, but, you know, a good edge data center operator is going to have a host of carriers peering, access to cloud, access to larger compute, and it's in the security levels that you're going to need out there. Um, and as we continue to grow and develop those strategies for moving content closer to the edge, you're still going to have the, the reverse when 5G hits of you're going to start bringing content back in from the edge just as fast. And, and you're not going to be able to, to absorb and consume all that. So the edge data centers will be that entrance point to the ecosystem. Your hybrid edge data centers will be the ones that then interconnect you back into the tier one cities and into the, the large compute environments. And so it starts to bring everything together very similar to, to, you know, older days when you started looking at the internet trying to be built. It, it took a lot of effort from a lot of different companies to build these ecosystems where you start having peering points and, uh, you know, your regular transit and transport all comes together. And you can't do that in, in a one, you know, maybe it's got a, a couple different fiber routes as Hugh talked to going out to a single cellular, uh, or, I mean, to a single tower with the data center, you've got to have a lot of options. And that, that's where we play well in. You know, we, we, we sit there and we look at the fact that we're in a lot of uh, tier two cities where we have that access to that in proximity compute. Well, there's definitely a lot of transformation and disruption going on. And uh, uh, that's uh, actually perfect uh, segue for uh, the next question for Joe Real Schneider, Electric VP of Data Center Solutions. The digital transformation is uh, an imperative to remain competitive, of course. Uh, to meet the needs of the new digital world, data centers are transforming how they deploy and manage IT infrastructure. Can you share your thoughts on this transformation that is happening, Joe? Sure. Um, uh, I'd be uh, happy to. And thank you for having, uh, having us. And it's a great discussion. So I think, I mean, it's pretty simple. You mentioned the word digitization. Okay. Um, I, I give you a quick analogy what I, uh, and bring it back down, but, you know, forever the automobile has been engineered for the human driver, and now there's an autonomous vehicle. And if you were to just stop there and say, is it engineered the same? Is it operated the same? And is it maintained the same? Very quickly, all of us on this call, quickly, without being an automotive engineer, know that, yeah, it's operated differently, it's maintained differently, and it's designed a little bit differently and the edge is that same thing. And so traditional data centers is a lot of people, as you've heard everybody describe here, it's, it's a little bit, you know, uh, edge and, and hybrid edge and even micro edge is even a little bit further out and maybe the end point. And, and so all of that, you said the word digitization, the, the whole thing needs to be done in a autonomous way, similar to the, similar to the car. And so what you see, Tim and Flexential do and, and Marty at, at Deep Edge and certainly Hugh at Dark Points, and I can tell you this firsthand, you know, these, these companies here, they're transforming, they're embracing the digital age. They, 
they are bringing a little bit more automation. And by the way, they're doing it different too. Um, you, I can't tell you how many times the word ecosystem was mentioned by Tim or Marty or Hugh. And this is the whole secret to it. So the transformation really is the embracement of one, digitization, right? Two, we're figuring out that the ecosystem is a much better way to serve our clients. Because by the way, Tim's client is also Hugh's client. It's also Marty's client. It's also Schneider's client. And by the way, if there's an ecosystem that is formed where the strengths and, and core expertise can be brought into a solution to then be deployed more efficiently, CapEx, to be run more efficiently, OpEx, but certainly, and without oversight, maintaining the risk profile that these gentlemen have established uh, for their businesses. And so really, that's, I think, what's happening. And what we see is that transformation and embracing the fact that um, we need to have automation. We can't have a mechanic, an electrician, a database administrator. Oh, by the way, the security guard that checks the license that goes through the man trap at all these places. Okay. And that's what data centers do, but that's not how edge needs to. And what you see the transformation, what Tim is doing uh, and, and, and what Hugh is doing and, Mar and, and Marty's doing, look, they're, they're doing exactly what I just said, where they're, where they're embracing more automation. They're changing the way they're designing a little bit. They're, they're optimizing their entire business model. You started the question with Hugh on business model. The simple answer is this. If cost exceeds revenue, it's probably a shitty business model. <laughs> um, and hello, this is what this group of individuals and beyond is actually solving. And so, I believe this, this audience here can learn a great deal from this audience, not necessarily me, but this group of people are really transforming. And what you see these folks doing today is most likely what you're gonna see the majority of the industry do uh, moving forward. Well, thanks, Joe. That's a great way to put everything together. And um, one of the questions that I say for the later, le later part of the, of the session is one that I want to ask all of you, and, and we can try to address it uh, in the same order that you went. But I think uh, we would all benefit from you all answering. It's about 5G. Hello, I come from the wireless world. I have to ask. How is 5G changing the landscape of the interconnection and data center role? And obviously, uh, to close, I think it's important if you can add uh, a brief remarks about how is COVID affected your business? So we know that uh, COVID has affected 5G and 5G, it's, it's on everybody's mind these days. So why don't we start in the same order, Hugh? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. The, so 5G, obviously, it has been top of mind for a couple of years now. I too actually came from the wireless world. So understanding the progression of how these uh, generations come out. And um, as 3G was coming out, I, it, it had been in, in, in think mode for quite some time. And obviously 4G was in think mode for quite some time. And so we definitely have an overlap. 5G is very much a capacity um, type of, and as, as with everything you've got, you have capacity then you start back over uh, connectivity again. The first jump that we saw was that all of a sudden, all these data centers needed to be at the base of these towers. And it was very interesting to hear that, uh, given the fact that I was working very closely with uh, most of the tower operators back in the early 2000s, understand that there's a lot of challenges there. And there's also a lot of the technology is not solved yet so you've got a disconnect between the app developers and the physical network, and that gap can, can create some issues. And one of the things that I've always talked to people that I've always kind of said is, hey, guys, hold on a second. When you talk about mobile breakout, all of these things are fantastic. They all sound great. But then my question that I always ask people is, hey, guys, um, wait for the technology to catch up to your dreams. Your riddle me this. Do you log in before or after you make a financial transaction on your phone and understanding how does that technology work and who owns that technology, okay, and where are they currently interconnecting and peering 
and what are they going to need to do in order to push that out? I'm in no way saying that it's not going to. It absolutely will. But the steps that have to happen are significant. And, and they're not as simple as, hey, look at me. I've placed a box. Hey, the edge is here. Okay, absolutely not. That's not how that works. And so uh, 5G is going to be a benefiter of the edge. Okay. Um, it's not actually going to drive the edge. Okay. Because, for example, some of my fastest growth is on fiber networks. Okay. That are just trying to push that stuff further and further out. So 5G and the edge are going to end up coming together um, and really creating a, quite a, a very powerful, productive impact. But they're going to have to keep independently growing and evolving. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, your thoughts? Thank you, Latish. Uh, I, I think about the edge a little bit more differently. Um, I look at it more from the infrastructure perspective that whether it's a cell tower or it's a, it's a building in a tier two or a tier, tier three or even a tier one city, it, you have to look at, and everything really does tie back to the business model. The edge, the edge per se is not about um, reducing latency uh, just topically. Some applications don't need their latency reduced. So the cost difference between being at a tower uh, versus being 10 or 20 miles away uh, to gain a millisecond or two of latency may not actually be worth it. And it may be better for the buyer to actually be at a, a place that aggregates the infrastructure so they can reach more of it with less. So let me give you an example. If you're a CDN and uh, you want to deploy in a market, you're much better having a bigger deployment that's better aggregated and you get higher efficiencies of CPU and power and cooling and all those important things than disaggregating and getting out to uh, way deep into the to cell space where there's less amounts of users, it requires more amounts of servers and CPUs and things to accomplish basic minimums. So from a neutrality perspective, which is what we kind of keyed on in the beginning, I think that, you know, for my business, staying really deep in the infrastructure is the way for me to be best neutral and for the internet and for the applications that are going to ride on it. Whether it's compute, um, I don't really care, um, IP, breakout, it's all going to find its place in the ecosystem. Cost is going to be number one and latency is going to be a, a, a lay on to the cost benefits. If there are no cost benefits, um, the performance benefits are not necessarily going to be the driver. There has to be a cost benefit there. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Um, Tim, over to you. Yeah, Leticia, I'm I take a little bit different slant. I think the one thing that we learned with the pandemic and COVID was the fact that, uh, you know, remote working, remote learning, remote uh, telemedicine, all of these things are, are now here. You know, we talked about they were going to be the future. Well, the future came faster than we anticipated with the needs. And so that's going to lead into uh, technologies like 5G becoming even more prominent and more important to us and, and allowing folks to be remote and work remote. And then that's going to bring a, a new generation of technologies behind it. You know, you know Marty and, and Hugh both kind of talked about some different aspects of it, but I think that whole ecosystem is going to grow and accelerate now because of the the issues around the pandemic. But I also think we're learning that we don't need to be tied into offices. So if we can take a technology like 5G that allows us to experience those immersive experiences, the telemedicine, the stuff, I can work in a cabin up in the, the Rocky Mountains here in Colorado, or I could work along a beach house somewhere, and I don't need to be in a tier one city where I have all these traditional services now. I can start to, to really uh, benefit from that. And I think as you know, we've seen this exodus from the large uh, metropolitan areas because of the pandemics and folks wanting to, to do more. And you've seen the, you know, the big OTT starting to offer the ability for folks not even to go into offices. You know, Amazon's closed offices you know, across the board. Other folks have too. And so um, it, you know, the, the infrastructure that we have in our residential areas will not accommodate the amount of bandwidth that is going to be needed and therefore, the only other opportunity is for the MNOs to come out and build these 5G networks that we can start having alternatives and become a mobile workforce like we've always wanted to be. Okay, great team. Um, so now, Joe, we have a few minutes left, so I give it on to you to give it a powerful <laughs> closing thought. Well, I'm going to stick to the question, okay? First, you know, I think 4G was designed for consumers to view 
and we stream and we look and we do all things. Whereas 5G is really going to be designed and is designed for businesses to do. So all of the things that you just heard here with relative to 5G, it's all around how business and the businesses are able to then to leverage that technology to start to do some things. You heard telemedicine, autonomous, all that stuff. I think, I think 5G is, uh, is, is going to be very impactful and private. And so private 5G networks are going to be incredibly impactful. And we're going to see a lot of that, I think, before we start to see all of this stuff with virtual reality for consumers. Again, 5G is for businesses to do. And so I, I really think that we, we're going to start to see those types of things. And if you ask me what a use case is, I would say, and I'll tie it to, and I agree with Tim, you know, what has COVID done? COVID has just made the future sooner. If you were to say, are we going to do virtual reality? Are we going to do virtual meetings and all this stuff? Is digitization going to continue to grow? And if you ask that in December of 2019, all of us would have said yes. And then we would have said, what does that future kind of look like? We would have probably guessed what it looks like now. Okay. I'll say this. Look, I know that I have my friends and colleagues on the phone with me, but I'm going to be very, I, if, for those of you that know me, I'm a pretty straightforward guy. Look, these guys have built the network. You talk to you, Marty's talking about a, 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 an aggregation point where I can actually do things, maybe not at the far edge, but in a more efficient way. These folks have enabled us on the phone and others like them in this industry for economic engines still alive and well to this day, all driven by network and data centers, K through 12, alive and well. A little bit of stumble here and there, but as Tim said, alive and well. Secondary education, colleges, alive and well. That, that economic engine is still alive. Certainly e-commerce, okay? And then all of us, we're working from home. Would you consider that an economic engine? I certainly would. And by the way, that economic engine doesn't work without Marty or Tim or Hugh, the network, the interconnection, um, they're finding innovative ways to make the data traffic more efficient, whether it be in Marty's example, whether it be in Tim's example. Tim is talking more about bandwidth and speed. Marty's talking more uh, about volume and bandwidth and aggregation and economies of scale in a meaningful way, still getting to all of the eyeballs. I can't cross-connect at a tower, but I certainly can with Marty, okay? And so I would just say, all in all, um, the industry is going to continue to transform in a digital way. The, there's two core components. I think Tim's a champion of this, but it's power and network. And you, you better believe it. If you're lacking one or the other, you're out, period. And so that is how I would say. And as far as the impact for, for COVID, just the future's here. That's all. <laughs> Yeah, well, this has been a fantastic, fantastic uh, conversation. I personally have learned a lot from all of you, so thank you. And I hope the audience has as well. So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.